thanks everybody that's tuned in to have this conversation with us today. Um, Tracy and the Venture Cafe team have been great in uh, conceiving of this and helping us put together um, a terrific panel. Um, I think we'll have a lot of different perspectives uh, to share um, while, uh, while we have this conversation today from, uh, from different points of view. Uh, and I think, you know, most of all, uh, our hope is to be able to share some information today, uh, get some feedback, and, uh, and also maybe provide a little bit of comfort during a time of great uncertainty and, uh, and help hopefully we all can, uh, can help uh, people start to plan things going forward. Uh, my name is John Grady. I am at, with Wexford Science and Technology. Uh, I lead our work here in the Northeast part of the US. Uh, I'm relatively new at Wexford. I've been at Wexford since February. So I joke with my colleagues that I've worked longer from home than I did in the office for Wexford. But, uh, but uh, seeing the perspective of, uh, of innovation and development from a national perspective has been, uh, has been a great transition for me. Um, you know, as, uh, as Natalie said, we're gonna have this discussion. If you have questions today, I'll do my best to sort of keep up with the chat um, so people can ask questions in chat. Um, if you raise your hand, I'll do my best to keep, a, keep an eye on the screen and, uh, and get to questions as well. Um, introduce our panelists today. We have three folks who are joining us. Um, First, Dr. Kevin Volp from the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Kevin's gonna bring us kind of a unique perspective uh, with one foot in the world of medicine and public health, uh, and one foot in the world of business and technology. Uh, Kevin holds joint appointments at Penn's Medical School uh, and at Wharton. He's the founding director of Penn Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics and he also co-directs Penn's CDC Prevention Research Center, uh, both of which are uh, pretty relevant to the discussion we'll have today. Uh, Kevin's also working with some global technology companies uh, to, to look at issues around public health, uh, tracing, and, uh, and other applications in the pandemic. So Kevin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks uh, for having me. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Uh, second up is Megan Bilson. Megan's a VP for Global Talent at Amicus Therapeutics. Uh, she's a career executive in human resources and talent development. Uh, Megan's going to talk with us today a little bit from the employer and the employee perspective, uh, both around the pandemic, around concerns uh, that are being faced as people start to think about returning to work. Uh, and, uh, and I believe Amicus has been doing some work through the pandemic. So um, she has the opportunity of, uh, of having to manage talent and, uh, and employees through this process. So Megan, thank you for joining us as well. Thanks for having me. And then our third panelist is Mark Korczykowski. Mark is a colleague of mine at Wexford. Um, he oversees all of our real estate, our asset and property management across the 15 markets that we are in in the US. Uh, that represents about 50 different properties, over 100 uh, tenants that, uh, that occupy that space. So Mark will help us uh, with some insight into how building owners are starting to, uh, to think about reopening spaces, the, the questions and concerns, and maybe some of the best practices that are coming out of that. Um, and, then, uh, and then also help us with some of the things he's hearing from uh, his tenants as well. So Mark, thanks, nice to see you. Thanks. Um, over the last couple of months, I've gotten to watch Mark's beard evolve and grow. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a daily uh, feature on what we're gonna see the next time we see, uh, we see, Kat, we see Mark. Um, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the gray looks great. Um, the, um, I thought we'd start the discussion today, uh, Dr. Volp with you, um, and maybe start with just where do we stand from a public health perspective in terms of where this pandemic is? Where are we kind of maybe in the arc of it? Um, and what are some of the things we should be thinking about from a public health point of view as we think about returning to work? Yeah, well, this is a good question. And the answer largely depends on where you live. So in some countries, there is clearly containment and pretty effective containment uh, in countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, Switzerland. They've been able to start reopening schools and uh, resuming normal life. The US, I, I fear, is uh, unfortunately in most states a very different story. We have outside of New York City still rising case numbers and we still have inadequate supplies of tests. We don't have contact tracing systems in place. Uh, so in other words, despite having 
had social distance measures in place now for a couple months in many states, we really have not gotten control of the epidemic. And I, I think you'd have to be a real optimist to say that it looks like that's going to happen anytime soon. So we, we are really struggling in the U.S. And unfortunately, it looks like uh, we're going to have a pretty long period of time that, that may continue where we're going to be struggling with this for a while. You mentioned you know, the differences uh, across geography and, and uh, uh, in terms of time, in terms of how long the pandemic's been in places. What, what do, as, as we look at uh, the Philadelphia region, um, where do we think we stand in terms of where we've been and where we still have to go? Yeah. Well, the Philadelphia region, I guess I would say there's both good news and bad news. So Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, as you know, I think the governor moved fairly aggressively to mandate social distancing early enough that we never got into the kind of situation that New York City had, where I'm sure you've all read in the papers about the horrifying situation with overwhelming numbers of cases and hospitals and the healthcare system being totally overwhelmed and where providers were quite worried that they were going to have to ration who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. So the good news is we never got close to that situation. The bad news is that despite, in essence, having shut down much of the region now for about two months, we still in Philadelphia have about 350 new cases a day. And the public health department has basically said that uh, until we get down to 50 cases a day, they're not going to move, move us from red to yellow. So we still have a ways to go, and we don't have a, a great path to get there. The city has said they're not going to do contact tracing until we get down to um, roughly 50 a day because they don't have the capacity to handle that many. So still a big, big challenge here where I, I think the region is under siege, and we don't uh, really have a great path in terms of getting ourselves out of siege at the moment. So is, is that 50 cases a day kind of a, a, a shining light that everybody needs to keep an eye on in terms of, uh, of beginning to sort of return? Yeah, I mean, the, the more precise metric is it's 50 cases per 100,000 population over two week period. Mm -hmm. um, so that rounds to about 50 cases a day in Philadelphia, 50 new cases. The mm -hmm. real issue, I mean, there are really two main issues. One is, is it a low enough number of cases that if we had uh, more liberal social distancing policies, could we effectively contain those cases and prevent outbreaks from happening? Uh, but the other relevant metric is how many patients are being hospitalized and is that number low enough that our health system can provide the support needed to the population? What you don't want to have happen is what happened in places like Northern Italy or New York City, where the health system was so overrun that it really compromises the ability of healthcare providers. You know, they're trying their best, but when you're totally overwhelmed, you can't provide the same level of, of care and the same, achieve the same outcomes as you can when you're not, not overrun. You know, you mentioned we've been kind of living with this for two months or so now uh, here in the U.S. And, uh, I was wondering if, if, if we have started to see any clearer sense of how the, how the disease is transmitted and how that might shape our thinking about returning to kind of daily activities in, uh, in group settings. Yeah, it, it seems pretty clear that most of, it, of transmission is through respiratory droplets uh, and if everyone wears masks, that goes pretty far in terms of trying to reduce the risk of spread. And that's why the CDC changed their recommendations a few weeks ago to recommend universal masking uh, mm -hmm. in public settings. The return to work is an interesting set of issues because I, I think what a lot of companies have realized is that it only makes sense to have people return to work who absolutely need to go to work physically to be able to get their jobs done. Because as long as we don't have a vaccine and we don't have highly effective treatments, moving around, being in close proximity with lots of other people still creates lots of risk. And that will be true. You know, it's certainly true now. It will still be true 
if there's, let's say, 50 new cases a day in the region, uh, none of us, of course, want to have the preconditions to facilitate a new outbreak, which could cause the region to shut down again. So I think many employers are shifting their thinking into who can we keep home, who can still be productive at home, who needs to come in, and then what combination of physical distancing measures, hygiene, uh, new protocols, universal masking, testing, uh, how do we stand that up in such a way that we can keep those who are coming in as safe as possible? That's a good way to maybe bring Megan into the conversation a little bit in terms of, you know, how we see um, uh, employees and employers starting to think about um, not only the, the time that you might return to work, but how you might return to work. Um, and Megan, I was, I was wondering, um, you, first of all, you know, you have labs, you have uh, lots of life-sustaining activities going on at, uh, at Amicus. And have you been, have you had some people working through the, the pandemic over the last couple of months? Yeah, we have. Um, hi, everybody. Glad to be here. We, we have definitely had people going into our labs um, pretty much since we began. We, we started on the, I think, the early end of moving to quarantine. So we uh, made the decision on March 10th uh, to begin quarantine that Friday the 13th and quickly moved into it. Said we were going to test a day at home and see how it went, but uh, stayed right in it. And from that moment... That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty bold to pick Friday the 13th as like yeah. the test <laughs> yeah. We did laugh about that, not intentional at first, but um, so, you know, everything seemed to go well. But we did move right into it with our lab space as well in Philadelphia. So, um, but we did obviously curtail the activities, how many people were going into the office. We had sort of a rotation going on and still do now. Um, we really haven't missed a beat from that sense. We, what we started on March 13th carries on still today. We have people going into the office at opposite ends of our labs, only one person in each end of the lab at a time. Um, they are masked when they're coming into contact with each other. We have a sign in and sign out system that we're using. So we're sort of monitoring who's there and we've pushed everybody to really stay at home and do as much work as they can from home and then come into the labs um, on these scheduled rotations. And so we're still doing that. It's quite interesting in the past, the most recent pulse survey that we did across the organization, we actually had that part of the organization that works in the lab say they're quite happy to go to a 24 hour rotation shift as well. We've been doing it just during the day, um, but I think they feel like this is working really well and let's just have some people doing it through the night as well. And we won't really miss a beat with the experimentation that we're doing. So, um, you know, it's gone really well. No one else has been in the office except for some of our manufacturing personnel who are obviously you know, working that side of the house, again, on a rotation basis, mask, et cetera, all of the CDC guidelines in place. The rest of us, so that's probably about 500 others have been completely remote since March 13th um, and really haven't had a problem. Um, but we've been pulsing the organization. We pulsed uh, pretty early on in March and we just did another pulse survey in May and we're delighted with the results that are coming out of that. We're actually got a better response from the questions in May than we did in March. So people are starting to feel more comfortable with the go forward plan. And we even asked them if, are they happy to continue doing this? Is there anyone who can't? And, you know, out of 550 employees, we had 12 people, only 12 say they find this challenging. The rest mm -hmm. of the organization feels like they are just as productive and able to do this. Um, and we've now gone out and said, hey, we really don't foresee going back into the office before you know, sort of mid-September at this point, and even that, you know, obviously might not happen. So um, we've, we've really done very well, and I think are getting quite good feedback. The only thing that's happened recently is that people did sort of raise their hand when we went into a further um, remote work situation, obviously with all of the governor announcements and um, the extensions of that was, hey, I really can't sit in this chair anymore that I have at home, or I really do need a monitor, or I really do need a printer. And we've um, just sent out a survey this week and asked everyone just to tell us what they need, and we'll have it to them by next week. We'll, we'll get them, you know, we'll have them at the front office where they can pick up in the lobbies and things like that. So we're going to work through a process like that next week. But that is the most negative feedback that we've received. It sounds like you're staying, you know, in regular contact with folks. And as you said, the idea of kind of surveying and pulsing them on a regular basis 
you know, we hear a lot about the question of, of confidence, that, that employees want to have confidence uh, before they're ready to uh, return to work. And could you, could you talk a little about in some of that survey work that you do, or the, you know, what are the issues that do come up in terms of, uh, is there a question of con you know, concern or confidence? Um, are, are there changes in attitudes over time around things like staying home versus being in the office? Um, and uh, what, are there any other sort of trends that you've seen coming out of that survey? Yeah, that's a great question. When, when we first did the survey in March, obviously it was sort of the unknown and everybody was very worried about, you know, I don't know if I can do my job from home. I don't know if I can be productive. And now I have children or relatives and extended people with me in the home. And we spent a lot of time really teaching people how to work remote. Um, we had all the tools in place like Microsoft Teams and our Blue Jeans video. We just didn't use it as much and we have mm -hmm. got very skilled very quickly. So, you know, in the beginning, we heard a little bit of too many hours a day on the video. This is really intense. It's more meetings than I ever had. But what we have found is that flattened out after about a month or six weeks went by and people started to realize they didn't need everything to be on a video call. And I think what we're, we saw now, there were so many comments in this May poll survey that we did. We read every single one of them, but there was a great um, sort of apprehension that we might make the decision to go back into the office too soon. And so we've been super clear. We actually had a town hall this morning where John, our CEO said, you know, the minimum criteria for us is the fact that the locality, the country, the region, whatever, has cleared people to come out of quarantine. That is like the minimum base piece of information we need. And in addition to that, we're gonna look at, you know, sort of five or six other things before we even begin to think about making our way back into the office um, to not put our families and our employees at risk. Our, our commentary has been all along the health of our employees and the safety of our employees is number one of the utmost priority to us. So. You know, we've been really clear today. Some people in that town hall said, wow, you know, we really are going to be quite cautious. So I think just like we were the first out, I think, early May, early March to go into quarantine, I, I believe that we'll be one of the later ones to head back into the office, just making sure that we feel super safe. And we've said, because we do have just within, I think all companies do, you have people who are immunocompromised and or have family members that are that way. And um, you know, we've been really clear today as well in our town hall that we will not make anyone, any one individual, even when we make the decision to start slowly going back into the office, anyone who doesn't feel comfortable with that will not be forced back into the office in any way. So we'll continue. Um, but, you know, I have to be really honest. After we've done this sort of experiment, we've decided that, you know, we're actually work pretty well this way. And I don't know that we will ever go back to that old normal. Um, I think we will start to really see a new pattern of doing some days in the office and some days at home regularly on, on, a, on a weekly basis. And we were not that kind of company before. So that's been pretty exciting to see. You know, one of the things you hear from kind of the um, uh, work culture side of this is that uh, this, you know, senior managers are really the ones who are, are probably having their preconceptions change the most, right? Um, particularly around this question of can people be productive outside of the office. Um, it sounds like you guys have started to learn a little bit that, uh, that maybe you can be because you, you've been forced to do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested if you have a, other thoughts on that. And then the flip side of that is, you know, do you worry about, again, especially a place like Amicus where I think you have such a strong culture, um, do, you, do you worry about sustaining culture um, among your among your colleagues, uh, and and in a way that supports your continued kind of recruiting and and uh, and integration of talent. Yeah, those are great questions. The the first one I'll just say, you know, we absolutely are looking at our workforce across the board right now because there are clearly roles that need to be in the office and need that collaborative environment or need that lab space. And so, you know, we'll have to make the right decisions there. I, I think we have agreed though that that we believe that almost every role in our organization can do some time from home, some time remotely each week, even if it's only a day or two. Um, you know, so I think what we'll see is just a large span of, hey, we've decided some people can work from home you know, differently a couple more days a week. There are others that maybe will just get quiet time and time to concentrate working from home and we'll still come into our labs or some of those critical manufacturing roles. 
um, more often. We also know there are people who love working in the office and seeing people, so we'll have to find that right balance, uh, but, but we'll have to go through that. Right now, we're still in the, hey, this is temporary. Um, we're trying not to jump too quickly to the permanent solution yet. We're just trying to sort of meet the needs that we have right now. Um, in terms of the culture question, I think if you're not always worried about your culture, it's actually not a good thing. So um, we'll always be really focused on that. I do agree that you know, that time in the office and our culture, particularly at Amicus, is really important to us and I think a very unique one. So even when we think about, hey, maybe there's a future where we see us working partially from home and partially in the office, we've even started to talk about how you make sure the right teams are in the office together for that collaboration and to carry that culture forward. Um, I think you'll want to make sure that you enable that, that you help the culture around that. Um, you know, we've we're fortunate that we have a workforce that's been working together for quite a long time. And so that culture is already there, but I think we always wanna make sure we, we are culture carriers as certainly as we bring in new talent into the organization. Um, we all know that FaceTime is so valuable to all of us. So we'll have to find that balance and that happy medium. But um, we talk about it all the time right now. Like, you know, we really wanna make sure we don't lose our culture. Um, we were fortunate that we all knew each other pretty much before this started and we haven't really been hiring too much since then. But, you know, obviously as this goes further, we'll, we'll be hiring people and we'll want to make sure they know what it feels like to work within the amicus culture. Yeah, you would think that onboarding is, is clearly going to require attention. Um, the, um, you know, one of the things we, we've heard a lot from government officials over the last couple of months about setting you know, regulations about returning and, and as Kevin mentioned, some of the data and some of the measures we wanna keep an eye on for that. One of the things I haven't seen as much discussion on is once, once, the, once we reach those, those levels, um, have you heard from folks about things like what's the, for those that might come into work on a regular basis, you know, issues like transit and when I leave my house and that part of the journey from my house uh, to my office, right? Before we, we'll, we'll talk to Mark in a second about once what it means when you open the front door of the office. But ha have people expressed any concerns or anxiety about that? Yeah, that's definitely coming through in the commentary as well. It's not just, you know, so, so let me just back up. Even the people who are going into our labs over this patch of time, you know, rotating and taking those turns, were very clear in some of the surveys that we did that they were worried not once they were in the office, but during the time that it took them to get into the office, the, the commuting, the walking down the street, the passing people um, in Philadelphia, those things were concerning to them. So we've had our eye on that from the beginning and it is also mm -hmm. what will delay us going back into the office because it isn't just about, you know, you just snap your fingers and you're in the office. There's a lot that people have to, to do, especially in a, you know, commuting into Philadelphia or some of our locations, there's transit and, and commutes involved. So. That's, that's what will be a part of our decision making and will most likely delay us making that decision until we feel like it's the right time. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting because I think that public realm before you come into the office, right, is is not necessarily in your control. Um, and you, you, uh, everyone will want to have confidence uh, in, the, in the quality of that environment and that it's being regulated in some way. Uh, Turn to Mark a little bit and, you know, the transition of somebody that uh, figured out how to get to the office and needs to get to work now. Um, I know over the last couple of months, you have been in pretty constant contact with tenants and peers and you've been on webinars and gathering information. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the sort of key considerations that you're hearing and some of the maybe best practices that are starting to come out of that? Yeah, so our, our, our biggest challenge is that the, the, the bulk of the buildings that, that we have are multi-tenant buildings. So, so you've got a variety of users that potentially accesses the building. Um, <clears throat> if you have a building that's you know all Drexel alone, they can just kind of make rules and people have to follow those rules if they want to go in. We have to work under, you know, under the, the lease guidelines and, and whatnot. So our challenge has been how do we provide tenants kind of access uh, that they need work within the government mandates, which are really different across all the states and even across counties within the state. And then how do we use best practices to, to make sure tenants feel comfortable coming into the building? So there's a couple things that we're, we're looking at that are kind of clear across all the, um, all the seminars and everything that we've discussed. Um, number one, it's, it's really 
minimizing kind of person to person and person to surface contact. And this kind of goes back to what, um, what uh, Dr. Volpe said, you know, it's, it's the, it's the transmission across um, the, uh, the people. That's the, that's the challenge. So we're looking at everything from, you know, requiring face masks to walk in common areas of the building, um, looking at lobbies and how they're furnished, how they're set up, how people access them, having stairwells that are kind of one way to go up to your space, stairwells that have one way to come down, uh, looking at elevators saying, you know, there's, and you've got to measure each elevator to see if it fits, you know, can you have two or four people, everybody standing in the corners. So each building is really getting their kind of own operational plan based specifically around what that, how that building is, what community it's in, and what the common areas feel like in the buildings. Um, we, uh, the, the, the Wexford properties, Wexford Ventos properties, uh, we're fortunate because they're newer buildings and the bulk of them have some type of labs generally in them. So from a um, physical perspective, we have the ability to kind of ramp up the outside air, which is a recommendation that, that we're hearing kind of across the board now. Uh, the filtration in our buildings is, is generally at that standard already at the MERV 13 uh, level. So we're, we're actually set up pretty well to do that. It really falls back to the individual folks walking in and how you keep people as, uh, separated as best as you can. You know, physical barriers at the guard desk, um, you know, eliminating furniture. And then communication, um, having signage so that people understand what they, uh, where they can go, how they can access spaces, and then what the rules are. Um, you know, do you have to wear face masks? Uh, you know, how do, how do you enter and exit the building? If you're sick, what happens? We are not going as far, and this is a, a controversial topic um, with landlords, uh, the screening of folks coming in uh, mm -hmm. and temperature checking. Uh, our position is we, we're really not set up to do that. We can't um, tell individual tenants whether they, they can't or cannot come into the building. That really falls on the individual tenants. If they feel that they need to test their employees before they come in, then, then they should be testing them. Um, so our, our goal is to make sure everything is accessed in the lobby um, in a way that minimizes contact across people. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, as, as you start to think about some of these kind of reactions, right? The, like you mentioned, contact surfaces and common mm -hmm. areas and furniture and elevators. Um, we'll all be walking stairs more frequently, I think. Um, I'm glad our office and my office is on the second floor in our building. So I've been walking up and down the stairs. So it's a lot easier than going all the way up to Amicus's space on the stairs in our building. Um, but do, do you think that some of these lessons will become permanent, that, that they'll ultimately be integrated into the both the operations plans, but also if, into future designs of buildings? Um, I, I do. I think there I think there will be you know, again, I think it depends, number one, on, on how long this goes and how severe it continues to get. And what I'm hearing and even what Kevin was saying, you know, this, this just isn't going to go away. So, or anytime soon, until there's a vaccine, people are going to feel uncomfortable. So I, I think there are going to be things that are done that we're going to continue to do uh, as we, as we move beyond this. Um, you know, I don't think folks are necessarily going to continue wearing face masks a year from now. But if there's something else that pops up, I think they're gonna, you're gonna see that more adopted more quickly in the future. Yeah. I think from a design perspective, there are practical things that will happen. HVAC, more outside air, better filtration. Um, I think those are kind of low hanging fruit and folks will start to design those into new buildings. Mm -hmm. I think things like, and, and we've heard a variety of, you know, do we need to start kind of having wider spaces between sinks do we need hallways that are you know 12 feet wide i think that sounds great i think there's a practical challenge in that there's cost involved and um you know and it, 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 i read a good kind of contrarian article that <clears throat> you know during 9 11 right after 9 11 happened folks said there'd be no more high rises built in the in the country because of the risk and the danger and and you know we got we kind of got through that but 
there are things that have happened because of 9-11, more secured or more TSA. And I, I think you're going to find the same thing with buildings. I don't know what all those things are, but there will clearly be something taken away from this and, yeah. and integrated. And I, and, and I would say if folks in the audience have questions, feel free to use the chat. I'm going to continue our discussion uh, through this last 15 minutes, but we'll, we'll be happy to take Q&A. You know, I think on that point, Mark, the idea that there's there's always either a technological or some kind of innovation that responds to a crisis, and and I think you know your reference to 9/11 is interesting. In Philadelphia, we've seen you know the Comcast buildings get built in the post 9/11 environment, and they you know they reflect new structural systems, they reflect new technology around warning and exiting people, and um, and I wonder, uh, Kevin, from your point of view. Are we going to sort of come to is one of the realizations from this this uh, period that the notion of a pandemic is something that we need to think could happen more regularly, um, and will technology start to respond to that? It's an interesting question. I I think people's memories are sometimes short, but it's interesting to see that a lot of the Asian countries were much better prepared for this because of the experience they had with SARS around 2008. And I talked to a friend in Singapore right around the time this started and he said, Kevin, we've been preparing for this for the last 12 years. So I, I do hope that some of that vigilance remains. I also think it's an interesting question on going forward, I suspect, that there will be changes in the built environment that are designed anticipating that, for example, nobody should put in a toilet where you have to flush it manually or a sink. You know, you have to get your hands dirty after you clean your hands. Uh, so so I, I would think things like that uh, probably will change even more quickly than they have. But I think one of the big challenges for us is that this may change, uh, you know, I think as as uh, has been alluded to, this may change a lot of the way people work and interact with one another in ways which we're only beginning to understand. And, you know, and, that, and that's going to be a, a challenge for us as a society, because I, I think we're used to freely moving and people valuing the time they have together. And I suspect that there'll be a lot of caution for quite some period of time, even after there is a vaccine. Assuming yeah, I think, you know, it seems like as, as we, especially in the last week or two, maybe some of the pent up frustration that people's, you know, that this notion of kind of having your rights constrained or, you know, just culturally, you're not used to uh, this kind of behavior is, is something that'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking a little bit too about, um, you know, if we're more aware um, sort of culturally about the threat of pandemic, you know, we think a lot about, uh, you know, the threat of cybersecurity. We think about threats of terrorism. You know, the, and, and to your point, there's a lot of, uh, of energy and process and activity put into preventing those things. And around pandemic, and, and you talked about this uh, in your opening remarks, the, the notion of things like contact tracing and uh, things like your, your daily vital signs, right? Do we get to a point where technology enables the collection and management of that kind of data in a way that's more efficient, for instance, than like Mark's point, we don't really wanna see tables set up in lobbies of buildings where everybody that comes in the buildings getting their temperature taken, right? Um, do you see technology moving in that direction to enable those things? Well, you know, this is, this is I, I think will be one of the big battlegrounds in the coming months. Clearly in some other countries, that have gotten a better handle on this. There's been a much broader embrace of contact tracing tools, which in the US would have been considered unacceptable because of concerns about privacy. But I think the longer this goes on, and the more we see that countries like South Korea, which had a first case around the same time, and now have had a total of, you know, maybe 10 or 11,000 cases and, uh, you know, less than 100 deaths compared to the US where we're at 82,000 deaths and counting, um, people are going to start to wonder about the trade-offs and whether we've applied the lens of how we might think about things in normal times as opposed to in a highly deadly pandemic. So I hope we don't wait too long to pivot and figure that out because I do think that there is a role for those tools to play 
Uh, when you look at the estimates for how many contact tracers are needed in the population, just for Philadelphia alone, the estimates are about 2,000 given the current caseload. 2,000 if, let's say, uh, you pay a contact tracer $35,000, $40,000 a year plus benefits, that's $50,000. You're talking about $100 million a year. And I don't see anyone coming up with $100 million a year anytime soon to support human contact tracers. So we have to figure out, you know, what are, what are the alternatives? And I think we all worry about digital tools and privacy, but of course, a lot of our movements are being tracked anyway. Uh, so, you know, we have to try to balance all these considerations and figure out wh what would yeah. make most sense. I think again, your point about sort of culture, I have, a, I have a friend whose daughter works in South Korea and she talked to her mom about how, you know, by the time she, from the time she leaves her house to the time she goes into her office, her temperature has been taken three or four times. Um, she's been, you know, had to respond to other kind of requests for information. Um, and I wonder a little bit, um, you know, some of this comes from a, you know, we expect to come maybe from the government in a regulatory way. But I also wonder from an employer's perspective, is there, is there a role for employers to play in really helping to adopt those kinds of uh, uh, policies as opposed to having them sort of forced onto people by the government, right? And I don't know if you have a sense like how, how folks in your team, Megan, might react to those kinds of opportunities if they were more ground up and more perceived as you know, supporting uh, the work environment than being imposed by the government from a regulatory point. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's something that we've definitely been talking about because, you know, we're obviously looking at all angles of this as we some point go back into the office. We've been looking at all the CDC guidelines, the OSHA requirements, what, what are the things that we need to do? How do we, you know, navigate with HIPAA? Um, what kinds of information can you collect? What can't you collect? You know, we've talked about who would do the testing at our front doors. Do, are we set up for that? How do we, you know, we, we've actually, we have a task force that we put in place and we've broken it up into different areas. And we have, you know, a medical part of our organization looking at all the testing that you have to do when people come back into the office all the way over to myself in terms of, you know, workspace and how are we setting that up and working with our facilities and moving our desks differently than they are now. So, um, you know, we're not opposed to doing that. We're just trying to find out a lot of these things. It's like you're building the plane as, as, as you're flying it, you know, what are these things that we need to do and making sure that we're, our, our senses, we want to be ready to go and we're ready to go. So how do we back that into a timeline and understand all these, these different aspects? I think, you know, we've, we've engaged some external consultants to help us think through that because I don't know that you could just reach out and say this is an expert in this field because um, we haven't necessarily done some of these things before. So um, we're sort of in information gathering mode and we started also to talk about our continuity of business plans that are just going to look so different now. We also started to look at all of our HR policies that now need to be sort of re- uh, you know, edited, updated, things are so different in terms of many policies that we have across HR. So um, it's sort of like taking this inventory and figuring out what that way forward is. I don't know that we're opposed to it. You just want to make sure you understand how you do it while you stay within all of the regulations that we need. Yeah. So you sort of trying to figure out where the boundaries are, right? Yeah, yeah and John, we haven't, um, you know, we're starting to see in, in our portfolio, some, uh, some states are opening up, some, some have already started opening last week. And one of the things we're looking closely at is, well, what are the requirements? Um, you know, is there a social distancing requirement? Do, are we, do we need to be taking temperatures? And for the most part, it's been maybe more generic than I would have kind of thought, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you adhere to social distancing, but there's no real guidance on, you know, taking temperatures or making sure, you know, kind of people are healthy before the office. It, it looks like they're really leaving that up to uh, the employers and, and the retailers of the folks where, where people are walking into the spaces. And it seems interesting, again, Kevin, maybe from the medical perspective, that when the pandemic started, we were totally focused on temperature, right? That if you had a fever and maybe you had some of these other respiratory signs, that was a problem. I saw some statistics the other day that 40% of cases don't involve a fever. Um, and so, you know, the, the question of what are we, you know, what are the right predictive mm -hmm. tools? Your comment about face masks, right? At the beginning, we were told, don't worry about face masks. And in the last few weeks, it's really been, it's been clear that those have become a, you know, a more integral part of fighting this. 
Um, so it's, it's trying to, trying to figure out, I guess, the right balance. But, you know, your, your comment at the beginning about really focusing on this idea that this, this is a virus that gets transmitted through um, direct contact with, uh, with droplets, right? Um, and trying to be able to sort of start with that and manage you know, back from that, uh, it, it seems to make sense. Um, we have a couple questions, or uh, one question maybe that I just following on the technology discussion, Jamie had asked a question about, you know, where in some places where technology has become more pervasive, like uh, food ordering and when everybody loves their Wawa screen, um, have we seen kind of the end of the, uh, the touch screen that everybody places their, you know, that number one, you look down on, you probably cough on and then you probably, you know, enter your, uh, your, your, uh, your order into. Um, and does, you know, does, does that technology somehow evolve or change uh, to reflect something like this? Yeah, I don't think there's any going back on some of these technologies. Similarly, in, in healthcare delivery, we've seen a dramatic shift towards remote visits and telehealth versus in person. Mm -hmm. I, I think patients really like the convenience and independent of avoiding risk of COVID, I suspect that will continue thereafter, assuming that health insurers remain willing to pay for it. But I think a lot of a lot of the innovations that have evolved, I, I suspect will not will not revert back to the prior state. And you, and you mentioned telehealth, and you know it seems like telehealth has been kind of lingering in the background for a while now, um, and I don't, up until the pandemic. And I, I assume that maybe has something to do with reimbursement. Um, but uh, is, is telehealth something that you think will really take into a take a much larger stage front and center? I don't think there's any question. Healthcare providers have wanted to do this for a long time and what really held them back was there wasn't a payment model for it. In other words, health insurers didn't wanna pay for telehealth visits. Now they don't have any choice. I, I think it's pretty clear you have to pay for telehealth visits in the current environment. That's gonna be true for, the, for as long as we don't have a vaccine. And I think over that period of time, this is gonna become pretty instantiated as the new normal in ways that will be hard to roll back. I think, you know, and I think the telehealth and, and in kind of a work environment, right, uh, Megan, I think you mentioned how we've all had these tools like Teams and BlueJeans and we just never use them. Um, I do think that this, the remoteness of all this, right, has driven much more awareness around the use of digital technology to connect. And whether it's to connect for work or socially or for health reasons. Um, and I think, uh, I think it will maybe one of the interesting things to watch will be uh, from a society perspective, do we put more focus on digital infrastructure and, and the notion that more people need to have regular access to digital infrastructure, right? We've seen this in schools where, you know, certain school districts, you know, might take six weeks to get their digital kind of platforms up and others are up and running kind of over a weekend. Um, but, uh, but if we're going to rely more generally on digital, uh, uh, infrastructure to to do things we're used to doing in person. Um, it's going to raise some equity issues around how people access those uh, those services, um, which maybe gives another opportunity for some innovation uh, in this space as well. Um, you know, my my uh, my my sort of parting question for everybody and and for those of us uh, that are especially in the Philadelphia area. Um, what do you think are the odds? Uh, and I don't know if I should do an over under, but you know, Megan, your comment about returning to work and people getting more comfortable. I saw a, uh, an interior designer who does a lot of work in Philadelphia mentioned that up until now, the exception in offices was that people would not work from the, from home, right? Um, the, the exception was that you would, you would stay home. Um, and it seems like we're maybe we're moving towards uh, the exception is that you come in the office, right? Um, where do you think we end up on that spectrum? Um, is it a 50 50 thing? Is it something more or less than that? You know, in, in my opinion, I think you mentioned earlier that there was a, you know, maybe a generational component or some of the more senior people in the organization didn't necessarily buy into the whole work from home, you know, that you were productive and that you were 100% dedicated to it. I think we've been able to sort of remove that perspective and, and people, I, I think you're going to see you know, a lean much more in favor of people being remote. It, it, it allows people to reduce footprints and office sizes and all that. 
Um, but I, I don't think we've had enough arguments of why this hasn't worked. I mean, clearly there's going to be some industries where it doesn't and manufacturing in places has been trippy, but I think you're definitely going to see a lean towards the other way. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. My watch says four o'clock and I think we're supposed to sign off at four. Um, so um, Kevin and Megan and Mark, uh, thanks for joining us to everyone in the office and the, uh, in the audience, I almost said the office. Uh, to everyone in the audience, um, thanks for joining us as well. Um, and we hope this was uh, was a productive discussion for everybody. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone.